So we're going to incline together over the next hour to exploring evolving Dharma, and in particular, the first noble truth, how it's evolving and how it changes through each of the turnings. And really part of the intention is to sense into the way that our interpretation and the context actually does matter and how we practice. It, they, it has a practical implication actually to sense into the way uh, the Buddhist teachings evolve, all right, and change. And we're gonna zoom in to, of course, the first evolving truth, which is there is suffering. All right, so some of you came in knowing that's the first evolving truth. There are three more, don't worry, yeah? So it's hard to talk about the first, which is suffering without acknowledging there's three more. We won't spend a whole lot of time on the whole picture. However, I want to just acknowledge that there's suffering, causes of suffering, <laughs> relief from suffering, and then our different paths along the journey all right as far as how that happens so we will unpack this a little bit more um, really zooming into how each turning the first turning of buddhism the second turning the third turning maybe even we're in the fourth turning now just kind of sense into that some the heads are nodding okay some of you are already taken that cool drank that kool-aid we're already in the fourth turn and got it um <laughs> so well this is an exploration i really want to invite us into the sense of this okay the sense of how um the buddhist teachings evolve and change impact our practice and yeah there's suffering and we'll explore from each turning how that changes okay before we get there, I um, want to say a little bit about who else is with me here. Vince, I've, I've kind of kicked us off. He's going to help me. We're going to explore this with you all. We're going to co-lead this. Um, we've been practicing together for, I don't know, since you were 19. I was 20. Um and we yeah, I was going to say, do you want to use the this life or the multiple life model? Yeah, turn what turning do you want to look at this from? Uh, that's part of what we're going to pack. And I really do want to make this like Vince and I, we've been teaching. This isn't our first rodeo. However, this actually is our first talk, exploration um, together in some years now, actually. So it's really a, um, a beautiful time to just kind of relook at this and see, okay, even our teaching together has evolved. Even our practice together has evolved. And being in relationship has been one of the key um, parts and perhaps one of the key points in all the turning. So anyway, we'll unpack it, but let's, let's slow and steadily get there. I want to offer some time here for us to practice together. It'll be a formal guided practice. Um, and then after that, we'll open it up. Vince and I'll, um, I'll talk a bit more. Sound okay? If you don't wanna practice, feel free to do your own thing. Um, stretching, moving, whatever feels comfortable to you. Take a moment to get a sense now. What do you need in this moment so that we can start to gather and collect our attention collectively aiming for presence, awakeness, perhaps curiosity, hmm, evolving here. Hmm. And perhaps sensing the space that you're currently physically in. Noticing the sounds coming and going where you are, along with my voice coming and going. And for those of you that want to know, how long are we practicing for? We're going to just sense into this moment for about 10 minutes here together. And now this moment. And now this one.
And as you sense in to this moment, you might sense your own experience and notice if it's expanded, contracted, a little bit of both. And if there's that sense of contraction, perhaps see if you can be open to being contracted, being open to being closed. If your attention is absorbed in thinking and there's this sense, oh, my mind is so busy. Notice it as busy mind and see if you can soften around any sense that it needs to be any other way. Sometimes we threaten our thinking mind. So the invitation here is to see if you can just Ooh, all right, busy mind is like this. <laughs> And where is your attention now? I invite you to just relax into this knowing. And remembering the body breathing. The body breathing is like this. And what's happening now? If attention was absorbed in thinking, the invitation is to take a slight energetic shift backwards and down, sensing the vibrations, the energetic component of the thinking. You might be able to recognize a feeling, an emotion. I'm just gently remembering the body breathing. And if this is difficult, know it is difficult. Difficulty is like this.
Just sensing the body breathing. Allowing the sensations to move and to change. And perhaps recognizing that spacious mirror-like awareness. That holds it all. And as you sense into this moment, adjust your posture, your practice, as you feel need, it needs. Like, what do you need? See if you can allow yourself to move and to change. to hold your experience lightly in this moment. And whatever is happening, know what's happening. Moving is like this. Breathing is like this. And now in the last moment of this practice, I invite you in your own way to invite loving kindness, compassion, joy, the heart qualities, if you haven't already, opening the doors. May loving kindness arise. May compassion arise. Here we are getting ready to tune into and explore suffering. So may compassion arise. <laughs> may loving kindness arise. Let's hold it gently and lightly. And when you're ready, we're gonna slowly shift here. You can start to move your body a little bit. If your eyes are closed, open your eyes remembering everyone here. <laughs> and we're gonna open it up a little bit more and explore a little bit more. What is this? <laughs> Yeah, so I just want to add my welcome uh, to Emily's and say thank you for being here. Great to 
see all of you in real time. I feel like the more the internet evolves and develops, I don't know, sometimes it looks like de-evolution, but still the more it develops, it seems like the more rare it is actually to be spending time with each other in real time. So I consider this really an honor that you took time out of your day to, to explore this with us. And it's so cool to see familiar faces and meet some new faces and see some new faces as well. So yeah, welcome. I'm Vince Horn, Vince Fahuri Horn. I'm the co-founder of Buddhist Geeks um, and currently one of the guiding teachers along with Emily, um, co-guiding teachers. And um, we've sort of in the last um, few months been planning a virtual retreat called Evolving Dharma. And part of what we realized we needed to do is sort of try to explain what the heck this theme is and why we're doing it. Um, it's partially an invitation for those that want to actually sit on retreat with us and go deeper, but it's not, of course, necessary that you need to do that to be here and hopefully get some value from, from our time together. So um, today I want to uh, just open up this topic um, of the first evolving truth, which is uh, kind of an area that we'd like to explore in this upcoming retreat on evolving Dharma, um, and just talk a little bit about this, kind of explore it. Um, I'll say a little bit, and then Emily will be uh, chiming in, and it'll be more, we hope, like a conversation. Um, but there are some theoretical pieces that I want to share to help with framing. Um, and as Emily mentioned, we're, we're using a couple of different kind of models here together, and we're kind of mashing them up, you could say. We're looking at, um, at, at this teaching in Buddhism of the first noble truth, uh, in which it's often said that there is dukkha. There's this, um, and dukkha is the Pali word that describes uh, what it is uh, um, that there is. And we're gonna explore that, not just from a single perspective, but we wanna look at it from the perspective of each of these four turnings of Buddhism that Emily mentioned, or four iterations, you could also say, uh, of the Buddhist wisdom tradition. And these are um, things that have evolved over time. I wanna start by sharing a quote uh, from, from one of my early mentors and teachers, Ken Wilber. He's a philosopher, um, integral philosopher and, um, and, and serious Buddhist practitioner. And uh, it's his view of the four turnings that really informs this model that we're sharing the four turnings. Um, although you find it earlier in Buddhism, it's not just Wilber, he's building on top of a model. So here's a bit about the background of this model. Uh, Ken writes in the religion of tomorrow, um, Buddhism is a unique spiritual system in many ways, while also sharing some fundamental similarities with the other great wisdom traditions of humankind, right? Buddhism is great, it's not special. <laughs> uh, but perhaps one of its most unique features is its understanding in some schools that its own system is evolving or developing. This is generally expressed in the notion of the three great turnings of Buddhism the three major stages of unfolding that Buddhism has undergone according to Buddhism itself. The first turning of the wheel is early Buddhism, now generally believed to be represented by the Theravada school and thought to contain the historical Gautama Buddha's original teachings, which developed in the great axial period around the sixth century BCE. The second turning or the second iteration of the wheel represented by the Majamaka school uh, also sometimes known more colloquially as Mahayana, was founded by the genius philosopher sage Nagarjuna around the second century CE. And the third and final to date, great turning of the wheel represented by the Yogacara school originated in the second century CE, but had its period of greatest productivity in the fourth century CE with the brothers Asanga and Vasubandhu. All three turnings had profound impacts on every school of Buddhism that came after them, uh, claims here Ken Wilber in the religion of tomorrow. And I, I, I want to men mention that just so you understand, like there is a history here and there are certain people that are important in certain uh, time periods and, and figures, you know, it's important to look at this, I think, or be able to also from a historical perspective, you know, like uh, what is the history? Who are the, you know, what are the dates? Who are the people involved here? So I mentioned that. So you, you've got a little background. Um, we're not going to fixate too much on the, on the, the history part of this, um, but talk more about the implications of it, of this historical development on our understanding of suffering of dukkha. Um, so basically we're going to go through each of these turnings and just kind of explore it together. 
Um, I'm going to start here with the first turning. And I want to just, in simple terms, I want to say the first turning, the primary aim of it, as I understand it, is, is to develop wisdom. So wisdom is the aim of the first turning. Um, and the way that that wisdom, as I understand it, or, and certainly as I trained in it with Emily in, in insight meditation, which is really fashion, the insight meditation tradition, Joseph Goldstein, Jack Kornfield, Sharon Salzberg, all these teachers that we studied with, uh, including Kenneth Folk and Daniel Ingram, they all came out of the same um, Theravada school of Buddhism, primarily. They had influences from other places, but that was their main spiritual home. And so we learned about this, right? And we learned, and one of the main things that we were taught by all of our teachers was to pay attention to experience and notice your experience and notice particular things about your experience, not just anything. You don't just, they don't just tell you, okay, tune into your breath and then just see what happens. But there's actually pointers like, no, have you noticed that your breath is impermanent? Have you noticed that everything is changing? Um, have you noticed that even though you think you are a self and you, you know, we all believe at some level that we're solid, right? And stable and fixed somewhere. Uh, at least most of the time we believe this, right? Um, even though that's true, when we look for it in our experience, like what is the self? Is it the image that I have of myself? Is it, is it the sense of being over here, of watching? Like, what is it? When we look for it, we can't actually find any sensations that are stable long enough or, or sturdy enough to be a self, to be fixed. Um, so there's, there's a lack of a fixed self in experience, according to to this early teachings. And, 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 and part of the problem is when we, we think we are fixed somewhere and we try to fix ourselves somewhere, but everything is changing, right? Then we suffer. There's this existential suffering um, in the first noble truth that's described with the term dukkha. Um, and of course, there's more to it than that. Like in the first turning, there's lots of teachings on suffering and the different kinds of suffering and three kinds of suffering. And, you know, there's a lot there, but I just want to keep it simple and just say, um, in the, from the first turning perspective, we suffer because we think we're somebody, you know, and we think that we can hold on to or make stable some part of our experience. We want it to be a certain way. We want it to be pleasant usually, <laughs> and we want to feel good and expansive. I do too. Believe me, I want, I, right now I'm feeling contracted. I much would prefer that this be expansive, you know, the feeling, maybe that'll change as we go. But right now it's like, okay, there's contraction. I'd rather it not be that way. I want to get rid of it. I don't want to feel this way. Um, I'd rather feel good, you know, expanded. And if I can't feel better, then at the very least, I will like get on my phone and play some solitaire and tune out you know, of this whole thing. If I can't, if I can't make it feel better, um, if I can't get rid of the thing that's bothering me, at least I can tune out from it all. Right. And this is the basic early Buddhist teachings of how we, how we suffer. Um, and so uh, there's a lot, as you can tell, the focus is on us and our experience and our suffering. Uh, and it's also on, a liber on liberation and freedom from suffering. The Four Noble Truths point a path toward freedom. And the last thing I want to mention about the, the first turning, in addition to the, to the purpose being a kind of wisdom that helps us transcend our own suffering, to actually, uh, it's often called this, this uh, what wisdom is translated in Buddhism is also oftentimes as prajna or uh, panya in the Pali tradition. Uh, and the idea is with this prajna, this transcendent wisdom, the tr English translation often of prajna, helps us uh, let go of these limited ideas of who we think we are and to learn how to not rest exactly, but to let go into uh, the flow of experience. And what happens when we let go into the flow? Well, where do all things go? You know, where do they dissolve into? Well, you could say they dissolve into the source or nirvana or the don't know or to the unborn, the unmanifest. So when we let go, we truly are just with whatever is, then we're constantly dissolving back into the source. And we realize that fundamental wisdom. Uh, and it's something you can just realize. And that's, uh, to me, that's the goal of the first turning is to extinguish yourself in the source, uh, to find a freedom beyond the self, uh, which is inherently much more, you know, expansive, <laughs> um, because the self is kind of like a contraction itself. It's like a perpetual contraction. Uh, Adi Da, the spiritual teacher, I wouldn't recommend as a spiritual teacher, but it has some interesting ideas. He called it the self contraction. 
you know, that that's what the self is, is a contraction. Anyway, I want to open it up here and invite uh, Emily to uh, build on top of this. Um, what is suffering? And uh, what is it like from your point of view uh, in the first turning? You know, what, what is it that we're exploring here? Does, is what, what I said make sense to you? From the point of view of the self, <laughs> it definitely doesn't want to get rid, you know, I don't want to get rid of myself. It's not a problem necessarily, but from the first turning perspective, maybe so. Um, maybe it is a problem. And what I've really sensed with the suffering from the first turnings perspective is that it's, it's, it's up to me to get rid of it. <laughs> if that makes sense. It's like a, it's a very much an individualistic kind of lens um, that if I practice hard enough or if I uh, can go on retreat, um, then there's going to be some way that I'm going to be able to alleviate the suffering that's internal, like my internal suffering can be alleviated. Um, and that seems to be a lot of what the first like 10 years of my practice was really about when I would go on retreats and, and really practice really zooming into, okay, like what, I mean, of course there's more truths, right? The causes are the second one. So we're just going to lightly touch on these, but um, you know, part of the first turning in the practices, like really zoom us into, okay, let's see very clearly the wisdom, right? Let's see very clearly what um, this suffering is and how it actually comes to form. Um, whether it's contraction, we can name it contraction, we can name it dissatisfaction, we can name it stress. Um, there are different kinds of ways that we can kind of sense into, oh yeah, the impact of what this human condition. Um, and in the first turning, my overall sense is that something is not right with this human condition. <laughs> like there, there's gotta be some way out of this, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that fits with the Buddhist cosmology too, right? It's like the idea is that we're in samsara. We're like locked into this constant rebirth cycle and we're trying to explicitly break out of that in the early Buddhist view. We're trying to discover the nirvana. nirvana. Yeah, so that, that fits, I mean, to me, it fits. Um, I also wanted to mention the the ideal of the first turning is the arhat. You know, the the thing that's held up as the thing that you want to achieve in the first turning is uh, the arhat. The arhat is a term for a fully enlightened person, um, and and that the way that's defined in the first turning is the fully enlightened person has um, extinguished greed, hatred, and delusion completely and utterly, totally from their experience. They no longer um, you know, in, in the traditional interpretation, I think it's clear that, that there's this vision of no longer being moved by these experiences. Uh, maybe they no longer even arise. There's, there's an argument there, whether they even come up anymore. Um, and so the, again, the view of suffering is like extinguishing, getting rid of it. Um, nirvana literally does mean ex to extinguish like as an extinguishing a, a candle flame. So, so I think it's important to say the first turning is interested in getting rid of suffering and it sees the su source of suffering as the self. So if we get rid of that self fixation, then the suffering goes with it and the craving and wanting something other um, than, than this, then, you know, and you're good, you're all good. <laughs> At least that's what they say. I know I don't, I actually haven't realized that for myself as a permanent condition. So I question whether or not that's possible uh, or even um, preferable. Maybe as a monk, it would be preferable. Maybe that if you're living in an environment like that, it would be cool to just be, you know, just feeling good all the time. Doesn't seem possible as a parent. I don't know what you think about that. Well, I mean, just being on retreat and the first turning kind of context, concentration can build in a sense that can lead to states that would lead me to believe that it would be possible to completely extinguish the sensational component of my human experience but yet if i'm i'm still human like i can't so at a certain point i feel like practice has led me to kind of question the framework of the first turning and eventually i feel like we've let we gradually gravitated to practicing within the second turning you know mm -hmm. and just to highlight the way that 
our own practice has kind of gone through these turnings as well. Mm. Um, so the second turning, you want to. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the, the bit theory of, yeah. of that. Yeah. So the second turning, um, as Ken mentioned, you know, is linked to mostly most closely to a teacher named Nagarjuna, who's like mostly a mythical teacher. Like we don't really know much about them historically, but, um, but there's some, you know, teachings that are left behind by this person, <laughs> Nagarjuna. And um, they're pretty interesting and profound teachings in that they really question that whole frame, the framing we just shared of like that there is samsara, that we're stuck in this condition, and then there's nirvana, and that you can kind of get out of samsara and get into nirvana, which some uh, religious scholars have called cosmological dualism. You know, the idea that you have these two different realities and you can get out of, you know, get out of one and into the other. Um, and really the, the big shift in Nagarjuna's teachings was a kind of non-dualism or, or non-duality of these seemingly opposite things of samsara and nirvana, where he would actually say straight up, like samsara and nirvana are one. You know, these things are not actually separate from each other. Um, and, and, and why is this important or why, how does this happen? Or what is, you know, what is distinctive about the second turning? Um, for me, the aim of the second turning, it transcends and includes the first turning in that it adds an emphasis or it puts on equal footing compassion with wisdom. So this is that it's not that compassion wasn't in the first turning. It just wasn't held up to be as important as uh, wisdom, like there was sort of like a hierarchy of like, you got wisdom and everything else, <laughs> you know? Um, and so here it's like, well, actually no, compassion is on the same foot footing as wisdom. How, how or why is that true? Um, well, in the second turning, it, it, it turns out that um, the understanding of emptiness of the goal of practice changes the understanding of what it is that um, the view of what it is that uh, we're looking for and what this is. And it moves from being like everything in here is empty of a fixed solid self. And it shifts to realize the realization that actually that same, that the, the condition that applies to you and that you've noticed in your experience applies to everyone and everything. Um, actually this emptiness, this perception of not fixedness you know, thingness is every, it, it, it really is a comp comprehensive truth. Um, and so we can actually see everyone is, is, is in the same boat. And what is this boat? Well, it's not that we don't have a fixed self, although that's what it looks like when I look at my own experience and I sort of see where is the self? Well, I can't find one, but actually whatever this self, this process that we call self is, uh, isn't a process that's just happening all by itself. It's happening with everyone else and everything else. Um, I mean, just literally, we're born of the earth, you know, the compounds of the earth, and and we're born, we literally cannot survive without the help of others. Um, and then even as when we become more independent and able to take care of our own bodily needs, like we still have all these other needs, emotional needs, and uh, connection needs. I mean, we all went through the pandemic. We all know this is true. And so, you know, um, here we are interwoven, interdependent, interconnected with each other. And that's in the second turning, the understanding of, of, of realization is that we're actually realizing not our no selfness, we're realizing our interdependence, uh, the way that our self experience is interwoven with everything else. Um, as Joan Halifax puts it, all beings, including each one of us, enemy and friend alike, exist in patterns of mutuality, interconnectedness, co-responsibility, and ultimately in unity. Ultimately is the part there that's important, in unity. And, the, and here, I think I want to mention in the, second, in the second turning, this key framework or practice or this key idea of the two truths, that we have two truths. There's the universal truth or universal truths, as I prefer to put it. And then there are pers the personal truth or personal truths. And the universal truths are the things that are true everywhere, all the time for everyone. 
Like these are like, you know, like everything is interconnected. That's a universal truth. <laughs> um, or everything changes. I would say maybe that's also potentially universal truth, you know, um, except for when you get down to absolute zero, right? Things don't change. Um, but anyway, uh, there are some exceptions. But that, this idea that there's both two truths that we have to keep in mind at once, the, the universal truth and the personal truth uh, is a key differentiator here. And, and we could say that wisdom, right, is the function that brings us into or helps us see the ultimate truth, the universals. Uh, but then once we realize that, how do we bring our understanding, our, our, our new insight, our knowledge, like wisdom about the way things are into our personal situation? We call this like integration, right? Uh, or just practice. <laughs> it's like, how do you actually uh, live like this is, these truths are true? And there we could say compassion is that movement back out. Um, I remember being on retreat with Joseph Goldstein um, on a, the three-month retreat at IMS, and he made this comment about compassion that surprised me at the time, where he said, compassion is the movement of emptiness. And I found that to be quite beautiful. Here's This is being put now by another uh, Buddhist teacher, a Chan teacher named uh, Guao Gu. I'm pronouncing that close. He says, in Buddhism, when intrinsic awakening is experientially realized, it's called selfless wisdom or prajna. Because this wisdom operates freely without self-referential obstructions, it responds skillfully to the needs of sentient beings. This is called great compassion. So there's a kind of recognition that like once you empty yourself out, like as in the first turning and realize that actually it's not just you that's empty. It's like everything is uh, uh, in the same condition. Uh, then there's this natural sense of, oh, I'm not fixed over here. Actually, like my identity isn't just over here. It can also be over there. And the more okay I am, the more actually I have the interest and capacity in increasing that sense of identity to include more. Like I actually want to include everyone in this sense of okayness, in this peace and freedom that I've discovered in the practice, there's this natural movement toward wanting to, uh, in the second turning, to alleviate or liberate suffering, um, seeing that it's unnecessary to some degree uh, to suffer. Because again, from the, the it, it, this is the weird part, from the second turning perspective, as I see it, there is no suffering uh, on the one hand, um, from the ultimate, from the universal perspective, they even say this in the Heart Sutra, this is the kind of the great text on non-duality, um, right? Where they say, there is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no end to suffering, no path to follow. There is no attainment of wisdom and no wisdom to attain. Um, in, the, in that sutra, they're pointing out the, the universal truth that ultimately in this sort of unity where everything you, you, you touch into the realization that everything is, and that includes all of the sensations that were previous to, to this moment of unity, you were like upsetting you, <laughs> you know, all of that, like including the self-contraction is, you know, part of this whole experience that we're having from that point of view, there's no suffering um, because there's everything, you know, there's suffering and there's awakening, there's freedom and there's constriction all of that is included uh, in this sort of ultimate uh, vision of reality that's, that includes everything. Um, but then relatively speaking, of course, we are still suffering and there is still problems and we still need to help each other. And all that is still also true. So in the second turning, we have this paradoxical understanding of suffering that's both true and not true. Um, the, on the one level, no one, there's no one suffering. Like that itself is a delusion that we harbor, you know. Um, on the other hand, of course, there are people that are suffering, and it's completely solipsistic to believe that there's no one suffering. <laughs> so we have to respond to these seemingly other people who are suffering. Okay, I'm going to stop there. That's my Dharma rant. Uh, Emily, you, you said your job here is to ground this in the practical. Is that true? <laughs> Perhaps. That's going to be hard. <laughs> uh, well, you know, let's just see. Part of what you didn't say that I feel like could um, support us and 
the practicality of it is the bodhisattva. Right. So that really arises as an image and as a symbol in the second turning. And for me, that's been it's been a bittersweet exploration. Like, what is that really? What's that energy of the bodhisattva? Like, what's the symbol of the bodhisattva? Um, it's 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 one who you know, it's not awakening or freedom from suffering, it's alleviating suffering. It's not just about my mine anymore. Okay. So the second turning, it's like, oh, wait, okay. I'm awakening to the fact, oh yeah, we are interconnected. Okay. <laughs> and it's, and for me, it was actually quite disappointing. All right. To realize, oh, okay. I actually am not going to be able to alleviate all my personal suffering because we're interconnected. Because right. you're married to and me. And so do what? <laughs> and because you're married to me, yeah. And I'm married to Vince and I and I have a kid. And you know, there is a really big, you know, racialized lens that we are all looking through all the time, you know, a lot of the time. And so I want to name that too, because like part of what comes into the conversation, I feel like in, in the Buddhist wisdom and in the Dharma circles and our communities right now, is like holding this both and practically speaking, it's actually a very big conversation um, where, you know, okay, I have, in order to really practice now, and be a bodhisattva, one that cares about the world, then I, I am inviting what wisdom from the first turning to see very clearly what's happening here and how my suffering actually inter, inter, inter bees with Vince's and it inter bees with our kid Xander, right? And so it's like, I can't, I've got to work with me, but then I've got to work with Vince and then I've got to work with Xander and we're just a whole like little, you know, just to zoom into our family. You know, at some points, it's like, we're a mess. You know, we're like a suffering ball of mess, you know? And if I'm just taking care of myself, which has time in an appropriate place, then that's okay. But really, you know, eventually I'm going to have to include more and more and more. It's a both and. It's a, it's a collective um, movement towards greater alleviation of suffering. And yeah, it's going to take my own part, but it's, it's, it expands it to include that, okay, this is more nuanced than maybe we could see in the first turning. I mean, remember the stories, the Buddhist, you know, the stories of his teachings, I mean, were happening in the context of, it was orally transmitted and he, he wasn't talking to people all over the world. Like we're talking to people, you know, I have people that I'm working with in the United States. I have people in the Ukraine. I have people in uh, Mexico. I have people all over the place, right? Buddha, who did he talk to? I mean, he roamed around, but it's just different to kind of see how, okay. Yeah. Every context and every time and every place now with the second turning, we're starting to come in contact with more beings right and okay so suffering is gonna it's not only going to be here it's going to be there we're going to be able to transcend it but that's not the only answer we also have to come back and say hey with compassion like how are we how are we going to make this human life workable we're in the same boat but we're not you know and that that's the conversation that's really important to start to hold together you know um yeah. So that's the second turning. Um, more to add, Vince, on the second turning. Yeah. I mean, I I, I think you mentioned the the uh, ideal of the bodhisattva. That's important. And yeah, like the second turning is kind of a bummer in that, like, yeah, you transcending your suffering, but you're you're not leaving it behind. Like, it's there's some sense of like transcending and including suffering rather than just transcending it. And it's collective. Like, I can't right. just. It's, it's like this, right. uh, the mirror neurons research, I feel like is an interesting, um, practical scientific way to explore this. It's, you know, how you can walk into a room and you might feel joyful and then, you know, somebody's upset and all of a sudden you're like, Ugh, right? Like we're mirror, I mean, with mirror neurons and the way that we are wired, it's not possible actually just to get out of it by yourself. Right. Um, Right. Unless you have like a private jet sitting idling, ready to bring you to your New Mexico, you know, your New Zealand. Yeah, but uh, even then, <laughs> even then, even then, no, even then, you're not, you're not escaping it. <clears throat> even then no. climate change will still affect your uh, hideout. <laughs> <laughs> right. However, all right, we're not going to, uh, okay. So then we the go third to the third turning. turning. 
Yeah. yeah let's. So then the third turning for turning. me and my practice has given me like, it actually brings me back into, for me, empowerment. All right. Nice. Because it's like, okay, so with the third turning, what, what starts to be explored? Um, Vince. Uh, everything. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, well, yeah, I like, I like the way you put this empowerment. So like if the aim of the first turning is wisdom, the second turning is wisdom plus compassion, both, then I would say that the aim of the third turning is wisdom plus compassion plus power, um, empowerment. And, um, part of this clicked for me while I was reading recently, a text called introduction to Tantra by a teacher named Lama Yeshe. And uh, here's the quote I want to share with you. And, and here he's talking about the ideal in the third turning, which is Buddhahood, like actually becoming a Buddha, perfectly enlightened being, and which seems like a really you know, tall order. But here's the vision. According to Buddhist terminology, the ultimate goal of our individual human evolution is enlightenment or Buddhahood. This state, which can be achieved by everyone, is attained when all the delusions, greed, hatred, ignorance, and the like, presently obscuring our mind, have been completely removed, and when all our positive qualities have been fully developed. This state of complete fulfillment, of full awakening, is characterized by unlimited wisdom, unlimited compassion, and unlimited skill or power. So in the third turning, which is often mostly associated with, um, you know, contemporarily with the Vajrayana tradition, um, especially in Tibet, they're not just, um, there is this emphasis often, and, and I'm not, my main practice home has not been in this tradition. So I speak about it a little bit from the outside, although I have done some, um, is that there's a focus really on, on how to most skillfully move toward this full awakening as quickly as possible. Um, and that it actually is possible to do that, even in a single human lifetime, um, that could be possible. And, and how is it possible? How does one do that? Well, you've got to turn everything into the path. Everything has to become the thing. There has to be no moment that's not meditation. Um, my teacher, Kenneth Fulkwin says, once said, you know, kind of jokingly, but half jokingly, you know, if you want to really be a slacker, like meditate two hours a day. You know, because like the idea is like, you really want to be meditating 24 hours a day, you know, if you're really serious about this stuff. Um, but how, yeah, how, do, how does one do that? Well, by turning everything that we previously thought of as a problem, you know, in the first turning, like greed, hatred, and delusion are things to avoid. You don't want to be feeling those things. You want to find ways to avoid them. You know, if you're feeling sleepy, stand up. If you're feeling, you know, greedy, focus on the shitty things. You know, the, uh, the, un, the, like the unbeautiful things. So you don't focus on the things that are, you know, delighting you. Uh, and here, actually, the, op the logic is reverse, where it's like, actually, those things can be the fuel for awakening too. Um, we can take our whole life just as it is, uh, including all of our delusion and our confusion and our stupidity. To be honest, sometimes we're stupid, <laughs> you know? Uh, and we can take that as the path. Like we can actually see see those as the as the fuel. So to me, that's the main shift in the third turning and how we relate to suffering is suffering is fuel for awakening. Uh, it doesn't, and, and it comes with awakening. There's no suffering, apart, there's no awakening apart from suffering. Um, so they're co-emergent in the Tibetan language. What do you think, Em? Is that true? That's, isn't that what Byron Katie asked? Is it true? <laughs> is it true i'll leave that with all of us to ask is this true this, these evolving truths um yeah the third turning in my experience for me it it really does take on like suffering and the alleviation of suffering becomes more of like an energetic exploration hmm. um and it's like okay so how do in some sense, I get this image of being like a magician or an out, like working with like, like this alchemical process. And it's like, I can't tell you exactly what kind of ingredients to sprinkle into what situation in order mm. to alleviate it completely. But mm. that's kind of the process that I feel like practice is asking of me now. It's like, okay, so here's life. It's going to be my teacher. <laughs> and I have Buddhist wisdom as this framework to kind of relax in. And through thousands of years, it's given me these pointers. And so 
huh, with the third turning, it's like suffering is malleable and, and I can help transform it rather than get rid of it. It's built into uh, this human experience. And um, as much as I want it to be different, it is this way right now. And it's workable. It is workable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And not only that, like, actually, it's even better if it's like really hard, <laughs> you know, from a certain perspective. Well, it is hard. I mean, life is hard. <laughs> you know, if, if this was easy, I don't know if we all 44 of us right now would be here, maybe. Uh, or maybe we would be you know, doing something else. It's like, and sometimes I feel like it's actually so easy that it's difficult. All right. And then we have all these turnings and all this philosophy and stuff, but like, what is this really pointing to, you know, is, is the question too. And perhaps that brings us into the fourth turning. I don't know. Like maybe some people say we're here, this is it. Um, as far as just Buddhism is concerned, uh, I feel like a consensus around that would be really hard to come by since we're now on a planetary conversation, a level of a planetary conversation. Um, I get really excited because that hasn't really um, you know, it's been happening, but I feel like it's, it's at a point now where, um, it's, it's definitely happening more consistently and communities are growing up around this. Um, so fourth turning, it's like, we, we just went through like perspective taking through the, I mean, we just took different perspectives and di different turnings around suffering. And in some sense, that might be part of the fourth turning. Yeah. Um, that we're able to take perspectives, that we're able to say, okay, this is what works, this is, doesn't work anymore. Um, actually, it's not even a complete picture. I might need to go to psychotherapy. I might need to go to my doctor. <laughs> I might need to, you know, there's other things involved in the fill in your blank. But for me, it seems like that's part of the fourth turning is filling in our own blanks around some sort of cohesion framework, all right? Um, so that's the edge for me. And I am curious to continue to explore this with whoever wants to continue to explore it. Um, Vince, do you have something to say about the fourth turning and, and where we're headed? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think we're, I, I think like, like you're saying the way I think of this is we're in it right now and have been at least since the beginning of modernity, um, and like, I think that's how I think of the fourth turning. It's like, it, it's everything. It, it's, it's, it's what, what we're living through is the convergence of all these different perspectives and kind of over being overwhelmed, honestly, um, by the perspectives. And, and part of the reaction to that is fundamentalism. Like people will shut down to all the, all the, the dizzying array of different ways of looking. And they'll just, this is the one true way, you know? And so that's one way of dealing with it. Um, I think the fourth turning for me, it invites a kind of uh, integration of different um, things that come from different backgrounds, which but which could be connected or, or used together in service of something deeper. Um, I'll share Ken Wilber's kind of take on this as well, which you know I think has informed me a lot. He says, known by various names from evolutionary Buddhism to integral Buddhism, the fourth turning, like all the previous turnings, transcends yet includes its predecessors, adding new material while retaining all the essentials. So I think that's important to me. It's like we, we, are, we are all in this position where we have access to all these teachings by virtue of the internet. We all are in the fourth turning um, because we all have to deal with this additional uh, element of perspective. Like, what does this all mean? Um, and how does it all fit together? And how do I get something to actually work, to be functional, not just for myself, but like even potentially for other people or, or uh, you know, at other scales. And I think um, for me, perspective is the thing that's added in the fourth turning in addition to wisdom, compassion, and power. And suffering is any time we run up against a perspective that we, we don't understand that we haven't yet understood fully enough to include in our awareness um, of what's happening. So uh, suffering points to our, our, the limits of our knowledge often here of where we, because when we understand something, right, and we accept that it's true, we don't suffer in the same way about it. Like 
it's like, oh, okay. Like I understand where you're coming from and I feel for you and like, and it and explains why you're being this way. Great. Okay. Um, so the things we don't understand and we can't explain, that's the things we haven't yet, we haven't yet integrated those into our own perspective taking. We don't know how to relate to them because we haven't been able to inhabit them and see from that point of view. Our self hasn't begun to include that yet, to, to transcend and include uh, those things. So to me, that's the invitation uh, of the fourth turning is to, is to constantly be looking to include more in our, in our way of, uh, in our sense making and how we make sense of the world um, so that we can more, more effectively respond uh, in, the, in the same way that the Bodhisattva does, uh, looking to alleviate suffering, but not just the Buddha suffering, suffering itself expands here. We understand suffering more broadly too. The causes of suffering are not just craving. Sometimes they're also having a lack of food or you know, stability in your external conditions. So we can operate, I think the ideal of this fourth turning is to transcend even the bodhisattva goal and to like see suffering in, in, more, in, 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 in more precision, like what is actually the causes of suffering. It's not just clinging, although that is important. Uh, so that, that's what I would end on here. Lovely. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you for being here, for taking the time yeah. to explore this. I mean, we do want to mention before we close that, of course, if you're interested in, uh, you know, in checking out the retreat that we're working on, um, it's coming up in June. It's a week-long retreat called Evolving Dharma. You can see it at evolvingdharma.com, uh, more details. And uh, we're also starting a training. Emily shared a link to it in the chat called Post Awakening. Uh, we're starting a training cohort in which we're going to work with folks who feel like they are working on uh, integrating uh, awakened awareness into their, uh, into their life. Uh, and so there's a unique set of challenges and opportunities that come with that. And uh, you're welcome to reach out to Emily if you're interested in that or that, that strikes you as being something that would be helpful. Um, and yeah, just thank you again for taking the time to be here. Great to practice with you. Hope this was helpful. Yeah, thank you all. And feel free to join us on the retreat. It's a retreat. And I just want to say that it's not a silent retreat. So we can go deeper in the context of your life if the scheduling allows. And it's a DIY kind of thing. You can kind of put together your own schedule. So I just wanted to clarify if your mind says retreat, oh, that looks this way. This one is a little bit different. So feel free to kind of feel into whether or not it's right and calls to you right now. Take good care, y'all. It was good to see you. Thank and you. Um, yeah, to be continued. <laughs>